Tales from the Usenet at CarolinaCon Online 2. Let's start with a little, bit, a little about me. My name is Jason Evans. I am a training engineer for SUSE Linux. I am also a board member for the Usenet Big 8 Management Board. We'll talk a little bit about what that means in just a moment. I'm a volunteer for the Tor project. I do tech support and like new user help on forums like Reddit and Stack Exchange. I'm not an official part of Tor project, but I do volunteer. I attend meetings sometimes. I, I do like the project and what they're doing, so I try to be a part of that. And I'm an all-around nerd. I've got a lot of different weird nerdy interests. I used to live in a triangle. I lived in the a triangle for 15 years from 2000 to 2015. Uh, and then I got the chance to move to Europe, where I am now in the Prague, Czech Republic. So let's begin with what is Usenet. Uh, the simplest term, I, the simplest definition I could find was Usenet is a decentralized worldwide peer-to-peer -peer system for circulating newsgroup articles. On Usenet, we call uh, messages articles, you know, get it, news articles. It has grown somewhat chaotically from the very big, small beginnings mostly as a labor of love. Most people who use Usenet now do it because they want to. I, there aren't that many people who get paid for Usenet use or anything. Uh, there are some companies out there that still provide Usenet service, but for the most part, people who use it are there because they want to use it. It is the original long form messaging service system that predates the internet as we know it. Now, back in 1979, whenever they first set up the first Usenet um, devices, um, there was no it was no internet. There was the ARPANET, which was a gov U.S. government program, but there was no internet. Now we come f to the more interesting definition of Usenet. Usenet is like a herd of performing elephants with diarrhea. Massive, difficult to redirect, all inspiring, entertaining, and a source of mind-boggling amounts of excrement when you least expect it. And that's from Gene Spafford back in 1992. Uh, 1992 time frame is what I would consider to be probably the golden age of Usenet, and that's something that we're going to talk about today. So how does it work? Uh, users read and send articles, that is met messages, on a new server. That server exchanges articles with other new servers across the Usenet, across the network. The collection of servers is known as the Usenet. So there is no top-down structure to Usenet whatsoever. Everything is peer-to-peer. -peer. It's all peer-to-peer -peer messaging. So let's begin with a little bit of history. In 1980, there was no internet. There was only the ARPANET, and few had access. Uh, from the stories that I've read, at the time, um, most universities and research institutions didn't even have ARPANET access. You needed to have political connections, as well as a substantial amount of money to even get those 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 um, those connections. Uh, two of the schools that did not have um, access to the ARPANET would be Duke and UNC. You, email has been around, so we needed something that was better than email. Uh, email's been around since before um, the Usenet. At the time, you could send messages to another person on the same machine, especially if you're using a mainframe or if you're using a mini computer where, where different people had different um, dumb terminals. You could send messages to each other. That would be email. Um, but there was no way to really send that to another person on another machine or to another city. Um, there were a few people had modems, um, uh, even like the first Usenet modems had been uh, cobbled together by, you know, as projects, um, there was really no way to talk to people outside with the uh, with the ARPANET. So if you had somebody on the ARPANET and they, and they want to talk to somebody who wasn't on the ARPANET, they literally would have to call them or send them um, snail mail because there is no inter there's no interconnectivity um, between the systems. And I'm sure somebody had like hacked together something once or, once or twice. I'm sure you know. There had been, you know, a few things where that happened, but by and large, that wasn't not common. So let's begin with Duke and UNC. In 1979, uh, students from Duke and, UN and, and UNC um, had PDP-11 mini computers. 
Um, the, computer, the picture on the left is from Duke. The picture on the right is from UNC. And at about that time, the new Unix version 7 came out. And that included a command called UUCP, or Unix to Unix copy. Now, this had originally been meant to just send one-off messages from, from user to user, or from machine to machine, you know, and that could go by modem. But they wanted to have a way to actually have multiple messages going out to, to people. Um, there had been things like, like, like mailing lists before, like where you can like send mail to a mailing list and other people on the machine can get that and you can have different discussion topics. But to be able to actually go from computer to computer and actually have places where you can just go check your messages and have multiple machines that would that would talk to each other, not just one or two, but actually, you know, three, four, dozen, hundred um, different computers talk to each other. That was something that was different. And this is actually before the first BBSs. The first BBSs came out in the early 80s. This is, was actually started as a project in November 1979. So let's talk about the rise and the fall of Usenet. So this is, this is the beginning. Uh, in the beginning, the Usenet arc, uh, achieved rapid growth. Hundreds of new new servers were added yearly. Universities and other institutions wanted to be a part of this network because they knew that knowledge and communication is, is everything when it comes to growth. So um, what had happened is in 1980, the, uh, the students from Duke had been at the Usenet's, Usenix conference and had presented this Usenet um, project that they were working on. And it grew like wildfire after that. You can see by the end of 1980, there were 15 different universities and research institutions that were on this. And that just exploded from there. So here's a, a logical map of what Usenet looked like in, 19, uh, in, in 1981. We can see here there's a few machines here from Duke, a few machines from UNC. Um, there were machines from Cornell, from Toronto. Uh, Microsoft is actually on here. They had their own PDP-11 or some similar VAX a mini computer that was on here. Purdue University is on here. Um, and they were part of this, this connection where they were able to send messages to each other. Now, because this is uh, probably on 300 baud modems and they and uh, telephone expenses, I mean, long distance calling was really expensive at the time. Um, you had a few um, uh, groups like Microsoft that had deep pockets that would do uh, more calling than others. So the smaller institutions probably couldn't afford a thousand or two thousand dollars a month uh, on telephone bills. So some of the bigger ones would pick up and actually call them instead of them calling out. Um, and this worked, for, for, this worked for a while. Um, and as you can see, it really blew up, especially whenever uh, land, uh, hardline connections started becoming more common um, and whenever the internet itself started coming in, where people actually had a, a static connection to an internet without needing to um, uh, dial to a bunch of uh, other users at the same time. So let's look at that. So this is a map of the Usenet in 1993. So this is, you know, 13 years later, um, and all of the black dots are um, our connections for, uh, and the um, of servers on the Usenet. We've got, of course, the United States is completely covered. So is most of Western Europe, but we also have several in Australia. Japan, South America, and because this is 1993 mm -hmm. and after the uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, we actually do have connections here from Russia, from Poland, um, and uh, several of the Eastern Bloc countries. So, what would happen? What, how did how did an, an actual user start using Usenet? Well, during the Golden Age and during the early 90s, before people had like home internet access. Most users were from, again, research institutions, universities, and corporations. Um, every September, new freshmen would, would, would arrive uh, in the computer science pr programs and other STEM programs, 
and they would be given their access to Usenet, but they would also be enculturated into how to use Usenet. You know, how do you not make a fool of yourself? How do you get along with other people on this Usenet thing? And then in 1993, America Online offered Usenet. Now, there had been other commercial entities offering Usenet prior to this, but they were more difficult to use. Um, they were really focused at the computer savvy um, com uh, users, but AOL was a general purpose um, platform for everybody. Um, if you're as old as I am, you probably remember getting floppy disks and CD-ROMs in the mail for AOL in, during the 90s. Um, with this, with AOL's focus on being easy to use and for everybody, this enculturation was gone. There was no now nobody there to tell people how to use Usenet, how to be a part of the community, and it went kind of crazy. Uh, at first, it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, I've actually read some of those. Um, some of those old archives during this time, most of the things where people were just using bad grammar, bad uh, bad um, practice on Usenet, for example, typing in all caps or starting flame wars and things like that, um, that was pretty easy to handle um, because you would say, okay, hey, so-and-so, this isn't how we do things here. If you want us to work with you, you have to, you know, you have to be in line with, with what the standards are for this community. And, and things weren't that bad, but this kind of opened the door for um, for users to start using Usenet all the time um, without any kind of way to learn what it means to be on the Usenet. Um, a few years later, um, the largest web-based Usenet service, which was Deja, at the, which was Deja, was bought out by Google. Uh, Google then started up Google Groups, which provided Google's own forums in addition to Usenet. The problem is that even to this day, Google never put in any kind of spam blocking. So if you wanted to, um, if you want to comment on YouTube, you need to like log in and do all of the stuff. If you want to spam the entire Usenet, you just need an account. You don't, you don't actually, there's nothing there to keep you from spamming multiple groups um, with whatever crap that you want. And that's still going on today. Right now, the, Google is the largest spammer on Usenet. And then things started going downhill. Uh, this is from 2005. AOL pulls the plug on their news group service. And this was not just AOL. This was actually a lot of companies that were doing the same thing. And the reason why is because there are two types of news, uh, news groups. There are binary groups where you can like get pictures and videos and software. And then there are ch talk groups. Well, what happened is that the binary groups started being um, used for child pornography. And a lot of the ISPs decided, you know what, we can't stop this Usenet thing. Trust me, they had tried. Um, there, Usenet providers have been sued so many times at this point, but there's nothing you can do. Just because one server decides to pull articles, it's a completely peer-to-peer -peer system. It still is. Um, just because there are these issues um, and somebody pulls articles from one server, it doesn't affect the rest of Usenet. The rest of Usenet can keep on going on without affecting, without being affected by one server going down. So the ISPs decided to stop carrying Usenet. So you can see here Verizon, Sprint, um, um, Time Warner, uh, all decided to stop carrying Usenet about the same time. And this is about the same time that AOL started, started dropping their service. Um, and because people couldn't get a free and easy way to get to Usenet, I think this more than anything um, has hurt Usenet. Now, there are still free ser services that you can go out there and you can just get an account and use Usenet. Um, 
and there are lots of paid services where you can do the same thing. But it's not like this. It's not the same thing as having it just a part of your of your current service where you can just log in and use it. Um, sadly, a few years later, uh, Duke took down their Usenet server. So one of the first um, uh, computers to actually use Usenet was in Duke, and Duke had been running their own server for many years, and then slowly, sadly they shut down their server not long after that. This is about 20, 2009. Um, mostly because people had decided to use Facebook, Reddit, and other forums. Um, and there are good and bad reasons to do this, um, but the biggest problem is that um, people didn't want to deal with spam. But, um, but that's, you know, that's a discussion that we can have. Um, is spam really that big of a deal? Well, it's the, the, the whole reality of Usenet being that it's peer to peer means that it's up to the user to block what they don't want to see. Um, there are moderated groups out there, but there, there's not many. Um, so for the most part, it's up to you to block what you don't want to see rather than expecting a moderator to do it for you. Um, so why go on Usenet? and have to block what I don't like whenever I can just go to Reddit and let somebody else do it for me until that person on Reddit decides they don't like you and they block you anyway. <laughs> so there's no shadow banning on Usenet. Um, there's no outright banning because they don't like, somebody doesn't like you. All they can do is block you. And if, you're, if they complain to your provider, then you just go to another provider or you change your name. On Usenet, it's, it's kind of like the old the Wild West, but it also gave you the freedom to do what you want. This is the Usenet as of uh, 2020. So it is significantly smaller than that picture we saw from 1993, but it is still going. And not all of these are, um, are corporate um, entities. A lot of these are people like you and I who run their own servers. They're hobbyists, they believe in Usenet, they want to see it thrive, and they keep their servers up, and that way we can keep the network going. Um, you can't kill the Usenet unless you take down everything. And even then, there's nothing stopping two servers from making connections and starting a new Usenet. And that's just the, the, the reality of the peer-to-peer -peer nature of Usenet. So, how are we bringing things back from the dead? In 2014, all of the members of the Big Eight Management Board, these are the, the people who ran, ran the, the um, Big Eight hierarchies in Usenet. Uh, these are the traditional um, hierarchies that have been there, not since the beginning, but they are the descendants of, from the groups from the beginning. Um, all of the board, all the members who ran this board stepped down or they let their membership relapse and the board was basically dead. Without the Big Eight Board, no new news groups in these hierarchies could be created. Old ones could not be removed and changes could not be made to existing groups, um, etc. And then I posted on Reddit um, uh, um, in 2020 um, a open letter that I had sent to the board because the board email was still up. Um, and this is and I got a response. Um, and actually, at the same time that I had posted this um, um, open letter, someone else had actually written to the board at the same time, just you know, happenstance. Um, and we actually got together, and we had a meeting with the former board members. And from that point on, um, my colleague Tristan Miller and I became the um, board members for Usenet. Uh, Usenet Big Eight Management Board, and we also added in one more person, so now we're a board of three. Just so we can make changes together and be able to have a functioning board. So that's, that's what we're doing right now. So this is our website. Um, we are currently up and running. We um, have weekly weekly meetings. We've created um, a new, we created our first new news group last fall. We've deleted a few old news groups this year, 
and we're looking forward to continuing to add new news groups, um, make positive changes, and also do outreach like we're doing right now to try to get people interested in using Usenet again. Um, we've also got a Reddit su a subreddit, which is r slash classic Usenet, and we are openly trying to educate people on what is Usenet and how we can get people to use it again. I think it's important that we have a moderation-free distributed chat network. Um, by being moderation-free, uh, well, it's not completely moderation-free, but it's 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 not being centered around a specific company or organization. Um, we are peer-to-peer, -peer, so what one peer does does not necessarily affect the, the other peers. Now. As a rule, like if somebody creates a new news group, we try to get all of the, all of our peers to also carry it, but it's not necessary. I mean, it's not uh, it's not absolute that they will do it. But we have a pretty good track record of of, of working together. Um, if one uh, peer decides to start spamming everybody else, we can cut them off. Um, if one peer goes goes dead, you know, they, they decided to take down their server, it doesn't hurt the rest of the network. So we, we think it's resilient, and we think it's really great when it comes to dealing with things like censorship. So this is the new group that we created last fall. It's, it's comp.infosystems.gemini. Gemini is an awesome project that uh, basically is a cross between Gopher and the web. It's completely... Um, completely secure, but also minimal in that you don't have to worry about things like cookies or um, or other th um, or other things that you find annoying on the web. Um, so I'm not actually a part of this organist, you know this this project so much. I do use Gemini from time to time, but it was cool that we actually got to create a new news group uh, with people who are interested in using Usenet. So let's talk about some of the stories from Usenet, and that's really what we're here for today. Um, these are not in any specific order. Um, I just want to tell, uh, talk about some of the stories uh, from Usenet uh, to kind of give you an, an idea of what it was like, but also some of the weirder things that happened during our time. We're going to start with probably one of the most famous stories from Usenet, and that is from a grad student in Finland. So in 1991, a Finnish grad student by the name of Linus Torvalds was interested in designing his own operating system. At the time, some hobbyists were using a closed-sourced OS that was based on Unix called Minix. Linus wanted, to, wanted his OS to be free, but he promised that it wouldn't be big and professional. And here's his article. So um, he writes, I'm doing a free operating system. It's just a hobby. It won't be big and professional like GNU. The GNU he's, he's referring to is GNU Herd. And if you know anything about operating systems, it's uh, it was never really very big. <laughs> um, for 386 and 486 clones. Uh, this has been brewing since April and is starting to get ready. Um, I like any feedback on things people like or dislike about Minix. And my OS resembles... It's some it's somewhat same physical layout of the file system due to practical reasons and other things. So this is Linus's opening email discussing Linux, and of course this became incredibly popular. This is the kind of things that you could you could expect to see on Usenet in 1991. You could see people talking about new ideas and new projects, um, while things were much more limited in that people were on dial-up modems. Um, maybe Linus being at the university might, probably didn't need to dial up, but a lot of people did. Um, if you wanted to see the newest software um, packages, you would probably come to Usenet and talk and find somebody who's talking about it. If you want to find out what's kind of happening with Unix, if you want to see what's happening with Windows, this would be the place to go. Um, of course, it didn't take long for disagreements to arise. Andrew Tenenbaum, the originator of, of Minix, uh, the non-free Unix-like system for students, said that Linux is obsolete. But notice how he did it. While the article sum summary is somewhat inflammatory, saying that Linux is obsolete, he gave his reasons cal why calmly. These two threads persisted, in, persisted on Usenet for literally years. It was Usenet at its finest. In these years, the signal-to-noise -noise ratio was fantastic. I would argue that, again, that the 90s 
that the early 90s was the golden age for Usenet. That's not to say that there weren't the occasion, wasn't the occasional trolling, um, and there was a modicum of spam out there, but it was pretty tiny. Uh, but for the most part, the, the conversations were great, and people who and people who used it respected each other. So this is one of the first uh, funny um, instances of Usenet, and this is from the very early days. Uh, this is from this is Cremvax. Um, starting in April 1st, 1984, uh, there was an, an article sent out um, from the Soviet Union to Usenet to, to announce that they are officially on Usenet. And I'll, I'll leave this up here for just a moment so you can read it. Um, but it's basically the Soviet Union is saying, uh, a, 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 someone from the Soviet Union is saying, yes, we have our own server and now we want to join Usenet. Um, at the time, most Usenet servers were using um, on, on Usenet were on dumb terminals at universities, and the servers were running PDP-11 or VAX or other types of mini computers. And at the time, it wasn't really known if it was possible to spoof a user or a, or a complete server. Cramvax was proof that it was. So this was actually a really funny joke um, that they that they put out. Obviously, it's on April Fools. Um, and there was a lot of spam, a, a lot of feedback. A lot, this was a huge uh, flame, a flame war that went on because of this, because people were so upset that somebody was posting jokes on the Usenet. And again, this is 1984, so the Usenet had only been around for about four years, really. So, yeah, it's, it's, this is great. Um, this is a, an example of one of the responses. And... Um, I wanted to point out something here at the at the very end of this. Um, in the '90s and in the early 2000s, parents and legislators were talking a lot about internet addiction. A whole ten a whole ten years before the eternal September, and years before the internet or the web, people were already talking about um, about why people were taking the use net, taking being on the net as he says it so seriously. So I, I just like this thing. I, I know that's the case with some people. That's why the, the term nerd applies to computer people and not to those who spend all weekend watching TV sports. The real user is how well-rounded people's lives are. Flamers should go to de slash dev slash shrink, please. So I, I like this. I like the fact that it's it's sarcastic, but it's also uh, kind of kind of foreboding about how people would, would see their lives on the net. Um, years before there even was an internet. Let's talk about cypherpunks. Cypherpunks are one of my favorite uh, groups on the on the old internet. Um, and it's from them that we get a lot of our security that we have today. The cypherpunks mailing list and then the alt.cypherpunks news group uh, was the home for a group of anti-authoritarian hackers who cared about online freedom and privacy. Both the news group and the mailing list were home to individuals like the early cryptocurrency advocates. Online anarchists um, would be folks like the pre-WikiLeaks Julian Assange. Um, as, the, as, the news, as this news article states, the mailing list was originally started by John Gilmore, who is a founding member of the EFF, or the Electronic Freedom Foundation. Sadly, the news group didn't quite have the punch that the mailing list had in its prime, but it was a step forward. So it, this is just a cool little story about how, um, how whenever the, the mailing list got shut down, the cypherpunks were able to go to Usenet and still be able to, to, to function as they had been. So one of the people who was uh, famous on, um, on the cypherpunks mailing list and also in on the Usenet um, news group was Tim May. Tim May was one of the major vis uh, visitors to the Cypherpunks mailing list and, and the news group. This was an example. This is an example of an article that was discussed that was that he wrote years before the anonymous Satoshi Nakamoto um, invented Bitcoin. Was Nakamoto a member of these communities? It's impossible to say, but these communities were sent, were certainly influential on people like him. Or her. Um, before we leave the cypherpunks, I wanted to point out one more brief mention, and that is 
Phil Zimmerman's posting of the source code for PGP, or Pretty Good Privacy, in 1991 on Usenet. Without PGP, we would not have the internet security that we know today. At the time, strong encryption wasn't meant to be in the hands of regular people, and it was regulated with the same kind of legal pressure as firearms. Zimmerman was soon investigated by the government, and the indictment against him only ended five years later. PGP wasn't hidden away in some scholarly article on theoretical encryption. It was in the hands of people who needed it um, and used it um, available on the Usenet. So this was actually just the, the beginning um, message for that article, and it was the first of five articles, and together this was the uh, source code for PGP. And because I don't want to like have like 20 different slides with with source code, we only get the, the beginning here. But it's good to see where that came from. All right, let's talk about a few more. Uh, this is one, unfortunately, I couldn't find the original article on, so I just have to paste what I could find. You've probably heard of IMDb before. IMDb is Internet Movie Database. It's a very popular website. It was bought out by Amazon a few years ago. IMDb actually got it started as a set of Unix shell scripts. And they were written by Colin Needham, who is still the CEO of IMDb to this day. The scripts were distributed on the news group rec.arts.movies. So back in the day, if you wanted a, your own copy of IMDb, you could get it. He, he, he provided this free of charge on the Usenet. So this is just another thing. This is 1993. This is that, still that same, uh, same early version of, um, of Usenet before a lot of people were, were uh, uh, before a lot of people were on the Usenet or before a lot of people were on the internet, I should say. So it's really cool that this was something that was that was out there. Um, another thing that happened during this time was the Alt.Scientology War. This is an article from Wired that, um, as I said earlier, lots of people had tried to sue different Usenet providers over the years. And one of them was the Church of Scientology. Now, I'm not going to talk here about Scientology specifically, but I will say that on the Usenet, someone had published many documents that had been copyrighted and owned by the Church of Scientology um, as a means to educate people about what it believes. And before this point, all of this had been had been like internal secrets to their church. Um, and because of this, uh, Scientology, this this Church of Scientology went a little crazy with their lawsuits and uh, against individuals and against different services. But the, what they eventually found out is that it they couldn't really put a dent in this because the Usenet being, again, being peer-to-peer, -peer, even if they were to sue, let's say, Verizon because they had, they had their own news server or something and they were disseminating it, they would have to sue each and every news server and that just wasn't going to happen. Um, they eventually did get some of the larger um, services to delete those articles, but they couldn't get everybody to. And that's part of the resiliency of the Usenet. All right, well, thanks for, for coming to my talk. Uh, again, my name is Jason Evans, and I will be